Um, so let's get right into it. Um, you guys know me. Um, obviously, you're on my channel. I go by the name of Hink. And, uh, you know, we talk about things male enhancement related. And who do we have the pleasure of joining us today? Um, guys on Reddit know me as Perv McSwerve. My name is Adam uh, Romero, um, and I am the owner of Massive Novelties, the inventor of the Apex Extender and other soon to be famous products that are on the down low right now. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so to start, um, and I, you know, I've probably heard some of this along the way, but how, dude, like, how did you get into PE? And so for example, like I was tormented by being like a very tall person with a very like average PP. And so like, I always felt very small and was always insecure as a result. And then I found PE and now like everything is better. So, you know, how did, how did you get, get into this whole situation? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um, so I've always been, uh, I, I, I'm I'm gonna struggle for the terminology. I'm, I want to say like sexually uh, open or adventurous, um, in a in a monogamous way, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, human sexuality always interested me. It really, really fascinated me, and I, I think that there's you know a lot to it that uh, we you know we can kind of gloss over. Um, but to, to, to get to the point, um, I was married for 15 years, divorced, um, and then I met a girl, um, and she is you know now my girlfriend, and everybody knows her as Amber from Massive Novelties. If you've ever had anything shipped to you from Massive Novelties, she's the one that you know is doing it. And she's the brains behind the organization, um, but. You know, Amber was just really game for anything uh, that we wanted to do, you know, in bed. And I, I liked that about her. She was, you know, adventurous and um, fun. And uh, one day, um, I think I was maybe on Amazon or something like that. And um, I had I had briefly done a little bit of PE with like an ADS, you know, piece of shit ADS that you buy off of like eBay for mm -hmm. $15. And, um, yeah, surprisingly, I, I actually, I, I did, I did actually gain from it. Um, but, uh, it, it wasn't something that I was really focused on at that moment in time because I was going through a divorce. <laughs> so I was like, why the fuck am I even doing this right now? So, um, Amber uh, was sitting beside me. I think I was on Amazon and I, I think I saw like penis pumps come, come up or something like that. And I was like, hey, you think this would be fun? I was like, you want to try this? You want to do this? And she was like, it could be fun. Why not? So I bought uh, I bought some like, you know, piece of shit Amazon penis pump. And um, <clears throat> so I got it in the mail, opened it up, uh, started using it. And I was just like, holy shit, Amber, look at my dick. It looks huge. And she was like, holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> and um, so, you know, uh, later on that evening, we went to we went to bed and um, she was uh, very happy with the uh, results. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. So, so, yeah, that was that was really how it started for me. And I'm just like an obsessive personality. I don't I can't fuck around with anything leisurely. It's a it's a blessing and a curse. Um, but if I get into something, I get into it like hardcore. And so the second that I you know, discovered that, you know, penis pumps were cool and fun, I was like, oh, my God. OK, I, I need to uh, I need to uh, do a little bit more work and, and research into this. Yeah, fair, fair enough. And so one of the guys commented and said, oh, my God, that bro has some big hands. So, like, I think you've recently, like, measured your hands. H how big are they? I have. Okay, so this is a big, this is a thing. So like, okay, like my hands next to my face. Okay, so like yeah. it's not like a camera angle or anything. So yeah. my hands are four point five, because people, because this is the thing, dude. I I upload my progress photos. Yeah. And I guess we can talk about this later because I know somebody asked because I I uploaded my progress photos and I guess it just wasn't definitive enough proof for somebody that like um that I was actually you know, almost nine inches. Sure. Because it was like, 
that doesn't look like nine inches in your hand. And I was like, well, my hands are fucking huge. Like they're 4.5. <laughs> they are literally 4.5 oh, yeah. inches across. Damn. Yeah. yeah so, mine are about three and a half across. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, dude. So, See, if oh I my gosh. Your hands, so your hands. <laughs> if I had That's your hands, it. yeah, Nick would look enormous. Yes. So and I've, I've oftentimes like I fought the temptation to upload a progress picture with like my girlfriend holding it. Because I've been like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, that might be yeah. like, too porn, it, porny. <laughs> you know, I'll put a disclaimer on there. But, dude, I got a solution. When we do your next progress picks, we can just use my hands uh, on on your meat. Yeah. I mean, problem solved, I'm, right? Yeah. Be, it'll right. look huge. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> down, down for that. But all seriousness, though, like you have actually recently posted, um, you know, your 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 progress. But for those that don't know, like – so this is a two part question. Number number one, like, you know, go ahead and list like your starting measurements and your current measurements. And number two, for my personal curiosity is like, if you had to say like, what is the, like the one most important thing that has been like the trick for you? Cause quite honestly, dude, do you have the like most gains I've ever seen in the shortest period of time, like ever, like period. Yeah. So what is, what is, would you say is like your biggest, not trick, but tip for, if you can say one. So, sorry. Okay. So what are your results? And then like, what do you think it's mostly due to? Okay. So my starting measurements are a little bit of like a point of uh, a debate and contention, even, even to me. Um, sure. Because, because I don't actually have a starting progress photo. Um, yeah. The first, the first progress photo that I ever took was months into doing PE. And I was 7.25 inches, <clears throat> like on the dot. However, um, more recently, like a few months ago, I actually, when I was uh, scrolling through, uh, scrolling through my phone, I actually found like, I never send dick pics, but I, I actually had sent this one dick pic, like when I was like yeah. dating again. Right. And I found it and it was my dick next to a, <clears throat> like a can of shaving cream, because again, my hands like literally make my dick look <laughs> very average yeah. um so i you know i was talking to this girl and i was like no seriously i was like i i swear to god i'm this size and i was like i held it up to a thing of shaving cream um <clears throat> that can of shaving cream is exactly seven inches and it lines up exactly with the the top of my glands um the thing is i don't have any fat in my hip creases at all to the sides so if i do a bone press measurement from the pubic bone and then in the side to the hip crease I, mm -hmm. it'll be like an it'll be like an inch different so it, my starting length is actually pretty debatable i think bd and i have sort of eyeballed it as anywhere from 6.5 to 6.7 um yep. you know I, I i a seven inch can you know shoved into the my hip crease like i also i mean you know, I try and tell everybody, like, keep in mind, it's a dick pic. I was trying to make it look as big as fucking possible. It's probably right. jamming that thing into my, you know, like, hip socket. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, and then currently, uh, my my most recent measurement was just under nine inches. I suck at uh, remembering, like, the fractions, but it's, it's like, something, uh, you know, it's like one sixteenth of an inch or, or like, one eighth of an inch less than nine inches. Um, and over what actually, time span? Um, <laughs> so this is a thing is like I, early on, I really never wanted to tell anybody when I started PE because I was gaining so fast. And I saw guys on the forum, like I saw guys getting absolutely just like, blamed for saying that they, <laughs> sure. they gained an inch or they gained an inch and a half or something like that so like you know to this day i haven't actually said when exactly i started pe but i will reveal now <laughs> now that i'm you know an established uh yeah and trusted member of the community it was um the beginning of september uh 2022 Damn. So I, invented, <laughs> yeah, I, I came up with the, um, I came up with the apex or what would be the apex came up with Frankenstein December 15th. 
And so that's why that's why my progress post was originally on December 15th, because I wanted it mm -hmm. to be one year of high tension extending mm -hmm. um, and sort of to show people, you know, what the results were from that. So uh, you asked the the secret, the trick. Um, I think I have really good. I think I have really good genes for it. Um, like I am. I am like unusually uh, flexible. Mm -hmm. Like most like 260 pound guys can't like take oh. their foot over there. <laughs> you know. And so <laughs> I can um, <laughs> oh gosh, so that's ridiculous. I can still I can still and I, I don't practice doing that either. Um uh and I can still actually do like a full split Le legitimately yeah. I can do a full split. Um you know, maybe within two inches off the ground. And again, I don't practice that. So I think that I have a really advantageous genetic disposition to PE because my, you know, colliginous and ligament yeah. soft tissues seem to be very supple at rest. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think the other thing though, that I would say, you know, Genetically, genetically gifted. Absolutely. I will admit to that, but I started out right. I really did. I started out with a plan and I stuck to it. And, you know, if I, if I learned anything from, so I'm an all time top 100 um, power lifter in the 242 class. And if I could tell people the number one fuck up that they're making in the gym or like why they're not getting stronger, is because they're not sticking with a program. Mm -hmm. They'll do three weeks of this and then they'll do, you know, four weeks of this. And like, they never stick to a program. And the, the truth of the matter is if you stuck to even a shitty program, you would get stronger. You would get bigger. If you were consistent with a shitty program, you would get stronger and bigger and better and faster and, you know, a huge dick. But so that's the thing is that I, I see guys program hopping in the PE world too. But I knew already from experience that, you know, that was not the way to go. And so I just, yeah. uh, I just, I, I, you know, listened to read everything that M nine had written, uh, what BD had written, what you had written and said, and I just chose to, you know, combine that with what I knew about soft tissue coming in as a soft tissue clinician. Um, and so consistency uh, is the secret sauce. And I always tell yeah. people like the apex isn't magic. It's just that it's comfortable and it's easy to use. So you can be very consistent with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, great answers. And so guys, uh, we got 70 people on here and 15 likes. If you don't mind, just take a second to just hit that thumbs up button. It means, a, I think it means a lot, but you know, anyways, it, it means a lot to me personally. So I also have a two part follow-up question. And so yeah, I'm sure. not trying to be like, Oh my God, I'm so medical. Look at me. I'm so cool. But I don't know if you're familiar with like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome where you like literally, or like Marfan syndrome where you have these like connective tissue disorders. Um, yeah. But, you know, I always wonder, like, are those people actually going to be more prone to making gains if they're, I mean, kind of similar to what you said, if they already have like a, a loose, you know, collagen connected dis tissue disorder? Um, yeah. And so go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, please finish. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, well, it's better that you answer this because it's a kind of a separate question. So, so go, yeah, no, go ahead. Okay. So interestingly enough, I actually had a lot of clinical um, experience treating people with Ellis Dollar syndrome. Um, and the the thing about that, so so Ellis Dollar syndrome is basically just like an extreme pliability in the soft tissues, right? Right. So the thing is, I think that because those tissues are so supple, um, <laughs> supple, great word. They, they probably, <laughs> it, you know, it's a it's actually something I don't know. It's a physical therapist thing, like I, you know, all the PTs that I ever used to hang out with would actually say that, like it's a you know, yeah. I know in the non soft tissue world, it's like a funny word, <laughs> but <laughs> double is like actually a really great, you know, way to define certain tissue. So 
people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have hyperelasticity in their connective tissues. Okay, so okay. the thing is, you would think that these guys would grow really well from PE, but I actually, I actually think it might be the opposite. Mm. I actually think that because one of the ways that we grow our tissues is through the proprioceptors, sort of feeling pressure, feeling danger, feeling tension. So we have mechanical overload, mechanical stimulation, right? I, I think that to get them the proper amounts of mechanical stimulation, I think it would take a lot. Um, and, sure. you know, we sure. do know that there is a there is a response that's caused by microtrauma, right? Now, the thing is, in, in the hypertrophy world, we proved, like, a number of years ago that, like, micro tears are not they're not the most prevalent factor in hypertrophy they're just not um mm -hmm. it it is something that happens you do damage the cells but it's not to a large degree it's not like a huge percentage you know it's not even like 10 percent um you, you're talking about like a very small small percentage and there are other factors like edema mechanical tension and time under tension that are actually way more important than that so all of that to say, I think that people have, uh, that have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and things like that, they actually might have a harder time gaining. But that is my hypothesis, and I've not actually run into anybody that does PE that right. has had it. So right, yeah, yeah. See, I always wonder. I mean, it's 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 interesting, but I I wonder if there are like hyper responders like you that are maybe like you know, don't have true like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but have like maybe like a potential variant of it that makes the, you know, their collagen just a, a little bit more flexible or whatnot. But um, yeah, so follow up question kind of related is, you know, what do you think is like, if somebody says, if I'm consistent and, you know, follow the same routine, how much can I get in a year? Length and girth. Final answer, perv mix wear. I hate this question. Um, yeah. I hate this question. And I see it all the time. And I get I get dozens of DMs per day, and this is one of the most frequent questions that I get. And the answer, as much as it is, as much as it sounds like it's just a cop out answer, there is just simply no way for me to be able to predict and tell you that. There's mm -hmm. just not. Um, you know, there are too many variables at play uh, for me to make any kind of, you know actual you know conclusive statements about how much you're going to grow and the thing is i think we've i think we've pretty well established the averages of what people will gain in a year um you know and so i, I think that most people will agree that you know your first inch is going to be really easy but you know it's, it's probably going to take you you know six months to gain your first you know inch or so and then it's a it's a diminishing returns sort of deal after that right so it's like you know your first inch might come in six months and and we've seen it happen uh, you know we've seen it happen in shorter periods of time on getting bigger and on a joke for you um i mean i've seen guys that you know claim an inch in three months four months and i don't doubt you know i don't doubt the the you know uh validity of those claims i, I think that you know i think that there are a lot of suboptimal things before you know like before people start pe they probably are dealing with eq and other things and so i think that dealing with uh you know erection quality i mean if you did nothing other than just work on your cardiovascular health nutrition and optimize your eq i think that could probably bump most guys up a quarter if not a half an inch yeah yeah so so I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the cop out answer, but I, I honestly just tell people, you know, I just, uh, I just don't have uh, the kind of, you know, data to make any conclusive statements about that. I yeah. just think there are too many factors. So, yeah. Sorry. Sorry to disappoint everybody. No, oh. no, I mean that's that's a that's a very <laughs> well you know thought out answer, and that's you know one of the reasons why we have you on the channel today. See, you know, my my take on it is that. I would rather tell somebody, I would rather under promise and over deliver. And so like, yeah. to me, I try to tell people like, first of all, like it, the, the growth, I, in my opinion, is like very slow. And so I think that um, like, if you're consistent, getting a half an inch in length in, in a year is, is like, is, was what you should go for. And that way, like, yeah. 
you know, you probably won't be disappointed if you're consistent and you probably will gain more than that. Um, yeah. just depending on, on your routine and you know, how consistent you are, but, um, it's certainly something that comes up all the time. And so this next question is largely for my information because like, quite honestly, I haven't taken the time to really do like a deep dive into like tunica release. And so okay. I know you are literally a, like a soft tissue expert. So, you know, and I don't know if you like listed your like soft tissue credentials, if you feel comfortable doing so, you can like, you know, when I call you an expert, it's not, I'm not just like throwing that title out there. And so I, yeah, I just no, would like so, to hear from you soft tissue release yeah. in, in like a nutshell for like for, for dummies for this guy. Okay. So um, I've worked with the NFL, I've worked with Olympic athletes, PGA Tour. Um, I've uh, treated literally the strongest. Uh, powerlifters on the face of the planet, uh, Donnie, uh, Donnie Thompson, um, Mark Spud Bartley, Brian Carroll, Brian Hoff. Um, I've, I've worked on all of these guys extensively. Um, formally, I studied, um, <clears throat> well, a little bit of my like medical background. Formally, I studied emergency medicine uh, to be a paramedic. Um, and then I actually went from that to uh, biomechanics, kinesiology, and clinical applications of soft tissue work. Um, and I was, you know, fortunate enough to participate in a couple of studies and, um, you know, uh, contribute to some, uh, journals. And, uh, so I, I, you know, as much as I hate self-aggrandizing like terminology, like I, I, uh, you know, I, I've spent the, you know, <laughs> last decade being a soft tissue expert. So, um, those are the reasons why anybody should give a fuck what I think. So what, what is, what is your, what is the question? Like, what is tunica release or like what, you know? So, so um, like for me, like I don't do any tunica release, um, mostly a time constraint thing, but basically like, what is it in a nutshell? Like, what does it accomplish and, and how important do you feel it has been for, for your gains? Okay, so uh, to start, we have to go over a little basic anatomy of the penis, right? So before before we went live, you and I were talking about the established layers of fascia in the penis. So we have two layers that are established layers, um, and that is the superficial and then the deep, also called the Bucks fascia. Um, <clears throat> so it is my opinion that the tunica is a fascia-like substance. It seems to be uh, because the interesting thing about fascia is that fascia is a connective tissue, but it is just as much, maybe even more, a nervous tissue. Um, fascia actually has, I don't, I don't know if you know this or not, fascia actually has 10 times the proprioception that muscle has. And so, you know, that's basically to say fascia is 10 times more connected to our brain than mm -hmm. the surrounding muscle. So um, we, we don't tend to think of fascia as this, you know, really important thing. And it, and it truly is because, you know, up until, you know, the last hundred years or so, I mean, they literally, you know, even medical textbooks and, and things like that would just refer to it as viscera, you know, or something like that. And so it was just thought that it was just this loose connective tissue. Um, right. but now we know that it's actually an organ system it is, you know, our, our fascial system actually processes per second, more information than all of our senses combined. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's why we call proprioception our sixth sense, right? Um, proprioception just, you know, for, for everybody, proprioception is just how you know where you are in space. It's how you can close your eyes and touch your nose because you're not actually using touch or sight or smell or hearing, you know, to, 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 to do that. You're, you're using uh, proprioception, specifically what's called interoception, which is where your body is in space and what it does. Anyways, that being said, um, tunica is most definitely a fascia like substance. Um, the rate, uh, or sorry, the um, concentration of collagen elastin uh seems to be in line with a fascia like substance and um it does seem to respond in a like manner as uh fascia would um the 
what I mean by that is that um, I've done some experiments and and I've had other people replicate this experiment where there is a there is a certain load that you can get you know good elongation you might get like three percent of elongation and then you know let's say that's ten pounds and then I would go up to thirteen pounds you know the next day and actually or, or or like two days later and actually get less elongation so we know that fascia has a muscle splinting sort of ability. It can, uh, it, it can, it can become excited, and it can cause, uh, you know, itself to sort of contracture, um, and it, it it arouses the uh, surrounding muscle tissue to do the same. Um, so I think that there's like a Goldilocks zone in PE, um, mm-hmm. and and BD has started talking about this a lot, uh, mainly because he's a idea stealing whore um, <laughs> uh, um no i'm kidding i actually i i, I actually told him to i actually taught him told him to buy a book on uh, Asha by dr tom myers um called anatomy trains and yeah, so I think he he's been actually. talking yeah yeah oh yeah he's he's even admitting it in the comments yep. <laughs> <laughs> so i've gotten bd thinking a lot more about the central nervous system and how it reacts Mm-hmm. Um, because you know, to take it to something that you'll understand, I mean, you you understand this. Like most people might not know this, but um, you know, if you if you try and pull somebody's arm out of socket, even if they're unconscious, uh, their their body is going to resist it. Their muscles, their central sure. nervous system is actually going to resist it. Now, if you take that same person and you put them under general anesthesia, you knock out their mm-hmm. actual CNS. You can easily dislocate somebody's shoulder. You know, because they don't have the reactivity, they don't have that response going on. Um, and so I, I believe that there's a similar effect in PE. Uh, I really do. And I think that's where the tunica comes in. I think the tunica is a fascia like substance. And we need to, in PE, I think we need to start thinking about fascia a little bit more because it can sort of rate limit your gains. Mm hmm. Now, of course, okay, so here's the thing though too, like I said, if I if I get three percent elongation at ten pounds and then I go up to like thirteen pounds or fourteen pounds and I get less elongation, um, there is a point where you can go up, maybe it's like seventeen pounds, where you sure. are literally just going to rip through yeah. any compensatory any compensatory mechanism that your body tries to have. Um Guys, guys talk about turtling a lot, and turtling is yeah. a prime example of natural reactivity. And that's the thing is that guys will talk about, you know, doing sessions and then turtling, and it's like, well, that's clearly a sign of overwork or or too much strain because you've you've caused a muscle splinting response from the fascia, and it's contracted now. Um, so that being yeah. said, um, fascia is a loose connective tissue. Yeah, we call it the scaffolding of the body. Um, it's a very intelligent tissue. And uh, it can become disorganized. Um, I think, you know, PE is it, by nature traumatic. And so I think that we need to think about the tunica like we would think about training a muscle. You know, it's like you train your muscles, then they need release. They, they need massage. They need to be stretched and, you know, and normalized, you know. Um, so tunica release technique was basically something that I came up with. I came up with it, BD. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally playing. He's just so quick on the draw. Like we talk about something, we talk about something and, and like the next day he's got a video out about it. And I'm just like, damn, he's so fast. Like <laughs> I can't get my thoughts together fast enough to make a video like he can. Um, but I was doing my soft tissue thing, uh, you know, basically thinking of the penis as a, a piece of connective tissue. And I, and I was thinking, well, why can't we release this, um, you know, like we would release any other soft tissue, you mm-hmm. know? And so I have, I just did basically, uh, you know, a technique called myofascial release. That's one of the things that I studied. I, I did some myofascial release on on my penis. And I saw an extra 1.5% elongation that day. And I like 
you know, I track, I, I, you've seen my psychotic yes. tracking <laughs> logs, right? Like, okay. So, yeah. and that's another thing that I think is the key to my success is like, I track everything neurotically. So I was used to getting 2.5 to 2.7% elongation after, after a session. And then I got an extra 1.5% by doing nothing other than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically manipulating the soft tissue. So I think that what it's causing, I think it's causing arousal of our sympathetic nervous system. Mm. I think it's relaxing us. And I think, so, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, our, our fight, flight, or freeze, and then we have our rest, digest, recover nervous systems. and when you're in fight, flight, or freeze, you're stressed out. It actually causes a, a systemic tonus uh, elevation, and so that's the thing. Is um, you know, BD actually told me something funny uh, recently, and, and it's really, really pretty interested in something that I'm, I'm actually interested to talk to some other people about. Um, he's got a client who apparently he's a very you know like anxious guy. And this guy got a hold of some, uh, he got a hold of some, like, either CBD or, like, weed gummies or something like that. And, like, this guy was seeing, like, no elongation whatsoever, takes these gummies, chills the fuck out, and then all of a sudden, that session, weed cookies. Okay, he said it's weed cookies. Yeah, so he got weed cookies. So yeah. he basically ate these weed cookies and then saw you know, progress that day, whereas he just yeah. hadn't before. So again, I think, I think PE, I think we need to start thinking about the central nervous system's role in PE, you know, because a lot of people talk about like pelvic floor dysfunction and all of these things. And, you know, well, all of the muscles and the tendons and ligaments in our body are dictated and governed by our central nervous system, you know? Yeah. So we need to, um, we need to definitely start thinking a little bit, less mechanically like you know ooh, pull dick real hard make big pp you know? <laughs> right <laughs> right so um i will say that um you know because i i have kind of my my niche in the pe world is largely like injury related but uh hard flaccid is one of those things that comes up all the time and first yeah. of all i think that like like you said, there's a turtling response that i i believe is related to the fascia as well um right but yeah. people mistake like a turtle penis after doing like intense PE work with hard flaccid. And I'm like, no, yeah. no, no, like it's, that's very different. But then the other thing is people oftentimes complain of like, you know, help I'm sore in my lower abdomen, like what's going on. And I'm like, well, dude, that's your superficial bucks fascia that extends up onto your abdomen that is likely right. irritating you. That's why you feel it in your lower abs. And so right. I agree. I definitely don't think that the, the, the fascia gets talked about enough. And um, the fascia is certainly like integrally related to, to hard flaccid. And you can get like hard flaccid yeah. syndrome just, just from like damage to the fascia. And there's a, yeah, gosh, I forgot what these guys are called, but it's like DCT or, or some sort of like company that just specializes in basically like fascia work and not, not, not really like fascia release, but for hard flaccid, but you know, it's certainly everything is consistent with, with kind of what, what you're saying right That's there. And then the, uh, so, so you're mm. saying there's a company that there, there's a company that actually does soft tissue work for uh, soft flaccid. So um, I, I don't want to misspeak, but I know when I'm like doing my deep dives on hard flaccid, like there was this one yeah. company that kept coming up. I'll, send, I'll, I'll find a link and I'll send it to you. But but it's Please like, do, yeah, yeah. But literally, all, like it's all about how hard flaccid results from like damage to the fascia. Um, and so so, yeah, I'll find it and I'll send it to you. Um, and then the other yeah. thing that, um, you know, people, you know, message me, guys, if you need to reach me, my patreon.com slash docking. Um, but um, people have hard flaccid and they're so like freaked out because they either have a mild injury or they think they have an injury that their sympathetic system just goes crazy and it makes everything like 10 times worse. And I'm like, you need to yeah. relax, but yet they, they can't, and I can't say I blame them. And so I've actually started recommending yeah. things like ashwagandha, um, to help, you know, kind of take down that stress level, that cortisol level. So, um, I, I will keep the specifics of this experiment vague so that I 
do not put myself in a bad position. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, I'm intrigued. There are certain um, central nervous system depressants uh, that I have been experimenting with. Um, after uh, BD told me about the, the weed brownies mm-hmm. thing, and <clears throat> everybody's gonna run out and get weed brownies after this, you know? Right? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like weed brownies made my dick ten inches. Um, <laughs> um, so there are, you know, certain uh, cannabis depressants that I have uh, used and actually seen not not like 1.5 percent like the tunica release but i've actually seen a measurable yeah. you know something something that i would consider you know significant um uh in terms of elongation and in, and definitely in terms of the speed at which i reach my target elongation so i think that there is a lot I think that there's just a lot more that we 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 have to figure out about PE. We, we just like it's honestly not simple at all. It's very complex. You and I were talking about on you know earlier before we went live, like anatomists can't even agree <laughs> right completely on you know certain parts of the male and female anatomy. I mean, and there's you know. <laughs> ketamine it wasn't ketamine no i was supervised and that was prescribed so <laughs> um the uh <clears throat> the thing is um yeah people can't uh people that study this can't agree on it so i think that you know we're going to end up crowdsourcing all of this information eventually and I, I think 10 years down the road we're probably gonna we're probably gonna find that there's a more elegant way to do pe than sure. just hang as much as you possibly right. can. <laughs> right. So uh, we got a question that I see is up right now. You probably see it too. Um, so related, is Adderall killing my gains by Jeff? That's an interesting question. And um, so Adderall is an amphetamine, right? It's a, what, methylene oxymethamphetamine, something like that. Um <clears throat> he's like i don't know um uh adderall is an amphetamine and you know so it is a cns um it it it, it is excitatory to your cns um i i can't responsibly say yes it is or no it isn't i just don't think that there's enough data yet Uh, you know and again i i hate to give these kinds of answers um because I've heard a lot of I've heard a lot of different things about a lot of different medications. Um, one that I'm specifically interested in is um, uh, SSRIs and PE. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very interested in that because you know there used to be there used to be a lot of um, talk about SSRIs messing with maximal strength. That's actually been that's actually been largely disproven in recent mm-hmm. years. So yeah. I do wonder about certain medications that alter our cns and how that yeah. has an effect on p um so i don't know is adderall killing your gains probably not i mean like right. you know uh but could it could you grow faster not on adderall <laughs> maybe it's possible i mean yeah i i can definitely i can definitely make an argument for like down regulating the central nervous system in order to facilitate soft tissue elongation because that happens everywhere in the body, not just the penis. Dude, if, you know? if that was a paper, like I would be so happy to see that, what you just said. <laughs> facilitating <laughs> down regulation of the CNS for penis enlargement. Like, oh my gosh, I would I would certainly get hard if I came across that on PubMed. Um, we're gonna be the we're gonna have to, we're gonna be the ones to fund it, you know. We're I gonna know, have dude. to be the ones to fund it. <laughs> So, and, and, you know, my take on this is pretty similar. You know, the one thing that I'll say is kind of obvious is like, if you need your Adderall to function, like, obviously, if you can't focus enough to do PE without Adderall, like, you know, <laughs> no, it's Adderall's probably helping you. Um, but, you know, there's actually um, evidence now, 
Adderall is not the same as caffeine. You know, they're both kind of stimulants. They both kind of work sure. on similar pathways. But because uh, there's an argument like, oh, is caffeine killing my gains? And and actually, most of the evidence says that like caffeine in moderation can improve erectile function. Now, that doesn't necessarily yeah. correlate one to one with like enlargement. Um, but it is pretty interesting um, that, you know, so, so bottom line is probably not. But you could do an experiment. I mean, if you have a way of measuring consistently like PERV, you could try on it for a week and then try off of it for a week or two and then, you know, see if you get any additional elongation potentially yeah uh, caffeine is a really interesting caffeine is a really interesting substance because it's like it's so freely available and it's like oh yeah man should probably actually be a scheduled substance <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know Dude, like I mean, um, i've i've heard people talk about like if if aspirin was released today it would be a prescription you know yeah yeah um but you know the thing about caffeine is there are just as many studies that will say that caffeine is amazing as it is terrible. Like nobody can seem to make up their fucking mind about caffeine and it drives me right. insane. And right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I don't know. And there's not to go down a rabbit hole, but there is there's so much bias. If like, so is dairy good or bad? But then like you read a paper and it's like, dairy is actually amazing for you. And it's like sponsored by the dairy farmers of USA. And it's like, well, you know, of, of course. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and to I'm going to piggyback on that because I have a real I have a real bug up my ass about this. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of people who naysay the shit that I and BD talk about because they say like, well, there's no studies, and like, you know, there are studies that are done by like Falasan, and like they're the only FDA recommended, you know, whatever. Right. Um, okay, right. just remember that heroin was FDA approved at one point in time and actually prescribed. So, um, that's, that's certainly not like a golden seal of approval for me. Um, but you know, more importantly and, and, and more practically, of, of course, the study that was funded by Thalysan right. validates right. their product. Right. right. I, I remember, um, I remember back way back in the day, like 2010, like if anybody was on like bodybuilding.com, they remember like BCAAs had just come out. Cyvation. Huh. Yeah. Cyvation yeah. had come out with a product called extend and yep. um, bodybuilding.com. <laughs> sorry. Cyvation actually hired Dr. Jim Stepani to uh -huh. do a 12 week study on novices. And they basically found that like, <clears throat> it was an ad libitum, study which means that like they were just supposed to eat whatever they would normally eat and they were supposed to add in salvation extend um and the conclusion of it was basically that these novice athletes gained 12 pounds of muscle and lost four pounds of fat in four weeks and that's not typical for anabolic steroids right <laughs> right like i'm gear. sorry but like i <laughs> lost i lost all respect for Dr. Jim Stepani that day because yeah. I was just like, you have literally sold yeah. your medical degree. You literally yeah. just sold your medical degree. And that's all that yeah. it was. So I hate to sound like this. And it's not even like I'm like worried about them as competition because I don't think anybody's deciding, oh shit, by the Falisan or the Apex. Like those are two different things, you right. know? Right. But of course, the studies that have been published by the company validate their product but the important thing to note is that we don't have any comparison studies yeah yeah you know we don't have, we don't, we don't have any studies you know looking at higher tension and a more moderate length of time yeah so, that's, so one gonna, of the, that was my rant <laughs> well, one of the things that i that i always say very similarly is like there's never been a study that has proven that parachutes are effective never and so like we are, no, I mean, no, seriously, like that is a medical fact. Like there is not a study showing that parachutes work. And yet all these guys are like, well, you know, well, there's no studies and, you know, trying to nitpick everything. And it's like, you know, I, I mean, I, I get it, but also like even, um, you know, I recently actually had the pleasure of getting Dr. Um, Brandeis on here, the creator of that like P-Long protocol, which was like PRP extender, a pump and citrulline based supplement. Yeah, and he had like that, massive yeah. gains. But um, like there's just so many flaws with the study and everything was like everything was like sponsored now. But you, 
like, I think what a lot of people don't realize, and I know you get it, but like the cost of running a clinical trial is like in the hundreds Outbreak. of thousands to, to, to millions. Yeah. To do I mean, a simple and, one, to do a simple uh, one. Right. And then just getting things like your IRB, which is basically like the body that says, is this an ethical study or not? Just to like sign off on it is going to be like unbelievably like challenging to get. That's why I can't believe well, I Dr. Know. Brandeis got his P-Long study approved. And so, um, you know, I, I like, I, like certainly like, I, you know, I love data, um, but yeah. You know, sometimes the the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And but, you know, there is really good extender data. And so, I mean, at the very least, you can say like, okay, yeah, maybe there's not an apex clinical trial, but there's plenty of data on actually, quite honestly, shitty extenders showing that they very clearly extend length. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and that's the thing is that I, I, I try to remind people that, like, there's a point in time where it was like scientific fact that like the surface area of a bee's wings was not sufficient enough for it to fly and like there were you know there was a period of time where it was like stated as a scientific fact that a human being could not run a four minute mile right you know now you have high schoolers running four minute miles yeah yeah well i mean and then go ahead sorry i didn't mean to cut you off oh no i'm just saying that the 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 um Okay, so I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a real nerd. And and this is a thing that <clears throat> BD and I talk about a lot is um there is science and practice, okay? Mm-hmm. Um the the fact of the matter is the science does not ever happen first. You right. don't come up with right. you don't come up with, you know, a, a protocol or a technique or something based on you doing a study on it. No. What happens is somebody's doing their master's degree or somebody's doing their doctorate, you know, doctorate degree, and they already have an insight into some world or some, you know, some practice that's going on or something like that. And they decide to test it and they validate something that we already all actually know works. Yeah. Like, right. Um, so uh, Dr. Uh, Charles Poliquin uh, legendary, legendary coach, um, coached more gold medal Olympic athletes than any other human being in history. Um, uh, so uh, Dr. Poliquin said if he waited for studies to validate his methods, mm-hmm. he would miss two Olympic training cycles. So he said it would take it. He would. He said it would take people at least eight years to validate my training methods. But the fact of the matter is, he trained more Olympic gold medalists than anybody else in history. Yeah. So, like, you have to ask yourself at what point do you become a slave to the data? Right. You know. So, like, there are things that you know. I, I love Beatty. I absolutely fucking love him to death. Seriously, we we bonded like this. Um, oh, I could tell. Like, like right off the bat, right off the bat. Yeah. <clears throat> but there's just like a couple of things that he likes to be hard headed about with me. Wait, Beatty because- is hard headed. <laughs> What? That's not the because, guy that I know. <laughs> because of because of some scientific studies or something that had like sure. said something to the contrary, and so my response to these things is like I hold these beliefs because I squat over nine hundred pounds and am a top <laughs> all time top one hundred power lifter, and yeah, so yeah. it's like. You can you can believe these you know studies if you if you want, but the fact of the matter is the people at the very top and the people that are succeeding at the sport like we we already know the facts of the matter because we're doing the things that yeah. people are going to do studies on later, right? And I think PE I think you know I think BD's on the right path with, you know, interval length protocols and things like that. And, and I think that he's going to be very validated one day in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when somebody finally does studies, I think that it's really going to validate a lot of what, you know, he has brought into the PE world. But again, yeah. you know, that that's where he, um, you know, he is pioneering in, in that way. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I don't think we can be a slave to the data. I think at some point you need to, you need to know the data, you need to know the science, but at some point you need to 
trust in your experience and you need to, you know, like when I go to train in the gym, like I don't take my fucking Excel spreadsheet. Like, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> that actually kind of surprises me. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> like I, I could actually I see you like, okay, I squatted, you know, this angle for this amount of time. Like, you know. so, yeah, yeah. So that's funny because like, uh, you know, you can ask, um, you can ask anybody that knows me. Like I, I, you know, I, I've read science and practice of strength training cover to cover and super training by Dr. Mel Sif, like a million, million times. And if you don't know what that, those are, those are like seminal works in strength and conditioning. And I know those books back and forth and I can quote you all of, you know, the like necessary charts and like things sure. about force velocity curves and things like that. But like, yeah. At a certain point, you just have to like go in the fucking gym and work really right. goddamn hard. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot yeah. science your way out of doing hard work. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the, the, uh, I, I mean, I, I agree with your points, you know, like a hundred percent. The only thing, so uh, a lot of my background is in cancer. That's where I actually have quite a few published literature, you know, on actually cancer research. But like a big thing is like, especially in cancer research, we'll be like, okay, this drug adding, you know, blah, blah, blues and in for cancer care. Like in this phase one study, we saw that it made like a huge difference. And then everybody's like, yes, this is the future. Everybody needs this. And then we do a phase three trial where they randomize it and it totally fizzles out and there's no benefit. And so... Yeah. Like that's one of the things that I kind of struggle with is like what to what to be kind of stuck on and what to not be. So like PRP, for example, the platelet rich plasma injections, like yeah. on the P long trial, he's like, oh, you know, we did these injections. It makes a huge difference. But in my opinion, it's like, well, you know, this is one of those things. It's tough because there's not a lot of there's no evidence showing that it has a role in enlargement. Obviously, because it's new and there's no papers on PP enlargement. But even like right. the actual like physiology of like why would that work? It doesn't really make sense to me. And so I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I just I I see what you're saying, yeah. but I also kind of struggle with uh, with that kind of internal debate about like what is valid and, and what is not, and how do you draw that line if there's no data. Yeah. And so what I think is when you find yourself on the cutting edge of something, <clears throat> um, when you find yourself on the cutting edge of something, that's when it, it becomes up to you to determine your risk reward and see if it, you know, works for, if it works for you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's not a study yeah. showing, there's not a study showing that BPC 157 increases, you know, your your penis length or girth but i've done two 30-day runs of bpc 157 injections and at both times uh had like a i, I don't know i think it was like a 10 percent uh increase over the previous um <clears throat> over the previous like what would be my projected gains what i would expect sure. to gain yeah it was like 10 10 percent more both times so again, okay. like there's not, there's we're going to no stop study. you there and we're going to talk about that right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, break down for those that, that are watching that don't know about the peptide, you know, BPC one, five, seven, um, just give a brief, just a, like a very brief one liner, what it is and like how, and just a brief couple lines about like how you sure. applied it. Sure. BPC one, five, seven stands for body protecting compound one fifty seven. Um, it is a peptide um, that was isolated from our gut. Right. Um, it plays a really important role in wound healing and cellular reparation. Yeah. So, um, again, we know that we do cause a bit of microtrauma to the tissues um, <clears throat> when we do PE. And I think that BPC 157. Um, injections uh I, I think that they help speed your recovery rate so that you can train harder so there's okay. oftentimes this so like sure. I, you know i i've never made a um i've i've never made you know I, i've made it very clear to people that um you know i, I have used performance enhancing drugs Sure. Um, it is a part of my sport. It is, it is what it is. Um, 
and I'll, I'll go ahead and answer this question because somebody's going to fucking type it. No, performance enhancing drugs do not help with PE at all. They don't. That's literally the question I just typed on my notes. <laughs> <laughs> No, they don't. There's, there's no, there's no possible way that it could because, you know, none of these, none of these compounds have any direct effect on connective tissue. Um, so think about it like this: like most of the androgen receptors, um, anabolic steroids aren't selective. Like that's why that's what SARM, that's what SARMs are. They're selective androgenic receptor modulators. So. Basically, uh, you know, if you're taking uh, an anabolic steroid like testosterone, it's going to bind to your androgen receptors, wherever those are. Um, oh, shut up, BD. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying he stole this. Uh, I stole this from him. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Or not. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, there's... Um, there's just not, you know, in terms of androgen receptors, when you look at connective tissue versus muscle tissue, like it's just not, it's not a, it's not a thing that, you know, it's not even comparable. And in my sport, oftentimes you'll see major connective tissue injuries because oh, yes. of anabolic steroids. So yeah. you see some high schooler blast a shit ton of gear. And so for context, um, our connective tissues, our, our, our tendons and ligaments are white on, you know, and, and our muscles are red. And that's because we have oxygenated blood in our muscles and uh, our uh, connective tissues, our ligaments are avascular. They rely on diffusion um, to oxygenate them. So they don't have a direct blood supply because they don't have a direct blood supply. I'm not telling you this, by the way. Nick. I'm just explaining. No, it's, it's all good, man. I can use, I'm starting to learn <laughs> uh, a few things too. Uh, because the avascular nature of the connective tissues, uh, they have about one eighth of the rate of healing. So it takes, uh, you know, it, it takes eight times longer for that tissue to regenerate. Um, and that's like, you know, there are even slower tissues like bone tissue. You know, I mean, like bone tissue yeah. regenerates what, like, a, like a, a bone cell turns over what, like every couple of years, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so no, um, oftentimes you'll see somebody start taking performance enhancing drugs and their muscles will grow very quickly. Their strength will grow very <laughs> rapidly and then they will blow their fucking quad tendon off because it simply has not adapted. Right. Um, because it can't, it doesn't have the nutritional resources. It doesn't have the blood flow oxygen. Um, I don't know if yeah. I even answered your question. So oh, BPC one five seven. Yeah. So let's go back to the BPC one five seven. Yeah. So BPC one five seven. I think that um, there are two things. I think that actually. So they've done like. Are you familiar with like the the data that they've done on like sham surgeries and just like saline yeah. injections and stuff like yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. So for for our audience, um, there are studies that have been done where they basically go in and they tell somebody that they're going to cut their knee open. And then mm -hmm. they're gonna replace, you know, place their meniscus, or they're gonna cut their shoulder yep. open, and they're gonna, you know, fix their. And the thing that happens is they cut, they cut that body part open, you know, in the OR, they make an incision, and then they literally yep. close it right back up. That yep. is the definition of a sham surgery. The funny thing is, with an o to an overwhelming degree, sham surgeries yep. actually work. Yep. They actually, more often than not, will fix the issue that is happening. Now, I have a couple of theories as to why that is. I think that local uh, healing factors, um, I, I think that, you know, uh, I think that it's basically a controlled wound healing response, you know? Okay. Um, I, I think that we pull local healing factors in that area. Um, and, you know, because of the inflammation, we get more blood flow in that area. And, you know... Uh, I, I just, you know, I think that most of these issues are treatable in other ways. I, I, I you know, I'm not going to say I hate orthopedic medicine. I'm just going to say that I right. think it's overprescribed. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to lead you back to BPC 157. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm going to circle back okay. around. I'm on. <laughs> okay. I'm on. Okay. All right. So, so in the same way that sham surgeries work, they've yeah. done. And I know you're aware of these studies. They've done things where, like, 
they'll give somebody an injection in their knee or in their shoulder, you know, and they'll tell them it's like a corticosteroid or something like that. Yeah. And it's literally just, it's normal saline, you know, right. it's, it's saline solution and they'll, they'll jam it in there. <clears throat> um, and then their knee gets better. Their shoulder gets better. And again, overwhelmingly consistently this works. Mm-hmm. So again, I think that injecting nearly anything, including normal saline might actually have a restorative effect because I believe that now that's a hot take. I know. I know. I like but it. Me I out. like it, man. Hear I'm me, here hear for me it. Out. Hear me out. Um, I, I believe it's a controlled wound healing response. So we do the same thing with uh, acupuncture and with uh, microneedling and with um, what's the what's the Western version of acupuncture? I am so ashamed that I'm the dry needling. Dry needling. Yes. Thank yeah. you. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, the thing that we know about uh, dry needling, microneedling, microchanneling, and acupuncture is that hmm. we cause local inflammation. We cause a local inflammatory response, and then we get a, a, a pooling of healing factors in that area. Um, <clears throat> so I believe that there, you know, is some benefit to using BPC-157, but I actually tend to think that, you know, if you injected normal saline, you, you may actually have, uh, you may actually have a similar result. So that's an, that's, I love that hot take, man. I'm serious. I I, I love that. (laughs) So and just to be clear, when you, when you say injecting BPC-157, you are talking about into your actual penile tissue? Into the corpus cavernosum, yes. So using the intercavernosal injection technique. Um, there are a lot of people that talk about doing it into the fat pad. I wasn't really, you know, I'm not afraid of needles. And so I was like, oh, sure, I'll grab an insulin syringe into my dick for science. <laughs> so, so you know, guys, just so you know, my take on this, um, you just have to be careful anytime you inject anything into your cavernosal tissue, there is the potential for scar tissue developing. There's a rat study that showed that just the fact of just injecting a needle can led to increased scar formation and like a higher risk of potentially Peyronie's disease. Typically, you know, in, in favor of what Perv is saying, you know, there, especially with something, a healing peptide like BPC-157, in theory, that might like reduce that risk. But I just, I just want to be clear. And so how often did you inject this I mean, now I'm I'm curious, dude. I mean, like, <laughs> how uh, often you my inject? my protocol. Um, I can't really outline my protocol right now. My training protocol because I developed a, a BD sort of knows about it, but I, I developed a protocol based on auto regulation, based on my daily bone press stretch flaccid measurements. And basically I would look at variances and like, if I'm at a certain measurement, I train that day because I know that my body's ready to train. If I'm at another measurement, I, I rest because I know that I'm not going to hit, you know, certain like elongation and I'm still actually experiencing tissue fatigue from the previous sessions. So I, I can't really detail that, but in general, my training sort of looked like two days on two days off or two days on one day off. And a lot of things I think contributed to that, like nutrition, training, sleep, sex. Um, you know, there are a lot of factors yeah. that I yeah. think go into the uh, restorative uh, or the restoration of the penis uh, during PE. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, I also wanted to I also wanted to add I don't um, I don't recommend that people do this uh, BPC one five seven. Uh, or take it lightly. Um, like I said, I, I did study emergency medicine. I was licensed to, you know, do injections. Sure. Um, and and I, I am familiar with aseptic protocol and technique. And so I, I know how to do these things safely. Um, <clears throat> but even that, even that, even that being said, you, you know, nobody's prescribing this BPC-157 to you. So like, you could be injecting canola oil into your dick. Yeah, yeah. So, so similarly, and maybe even just like a yes or no, um, TB 500 is another, another recovery peptide. Have you dabbled in that at all? I am dabbling in it now, uh, in a topical, uh, in a topical form. 
I, I, and I'll, I'll have to show you this because I showed I showed Beatty this a while back. Um, so when you're doing your own, you know, n equals one study, you don't want to add too many variables because then you don't know what the fuck did what, right? So like yeah. BPC one five seven, BPC one five seven, like doing it once and having good results, like one one time doesn't establish a trend, right? Like you've got to sure. you've got to repeat your results. Um, and so I kind of at this point know what BPC one five seven does for me. So I came across this product because you know supposedly the molecular weight of BPC one five seven is too high to actually. Uh, go through the skin, even with a carrier agent like the I always the MSO or whatever. The MSO, yeah, the MSO. Um, but there's this company that uh, it, I think it's called Muscle Gels, and there's a there's a topical. Uh, it's called Heels. Um, H e a l s. Um, yeah, yeah. By Muscle Gels with a Z, a Z G E L Z, and guys can look it up. But it it is uh, BPC one five seven and TB five hundred, but it has a it has a really interesting like a unique carrying agent that I've never seen before, and so mm. I, I mean, <clears throat> allegedly, you know, if they are to be believed, then they found a carrier agent that can actually deliver BPC one five seven and TB five hundred transdermally. Yeah. So, so if you think that BPC one five seven has been helpful for you, in my opinion, now correct me if I'm wrong. That would mean that, like one of our commenters pointed out, that that's why PRP would actually make a difference on a on a protocol. Is that fair to say, or or do you disagree with that? No, I don't disagree because I I, I agree with the fact that okay, so so PRP is actually even more traumatic. Um. Because yeah. you know, you're you're talking about cc's of fluid. You know, when you're talking about BPC one five seven, you're talking about if you mix it up, sure. You know, in, like uh, uh, right. It, it's I think it's point two, uh, you know, milliliters. Right, right. Yeah, point two so cc's. It's yeah. it's right. like nothing. Um, yeah. If you're talking about p, if you're talking about a PRP, you're you're drawing a lot of blood and you are injecting. A yeah. lot of playlists back into yeah. it. So again, I think that it's like a lot of these practices, like um, microdermabrasion, um, yeah. chemical peels, uh, microneedling, microchanneling. Um, what else? Gua sha, cupping. You know, I think it's one of these things where we we cause a controlled wound healing response. Um, and again, one of the things that you know we know that causes uh, tissue growth um, is that proprioception. Um, yeah. You know, edema edema triggers uh, satellite cells to, you know, cause a proliferation in uh, muscle tissue. And so, I think that there's potentially, you know, uh, I think that it's it's probably that you know just injecting a lot of anything into your dick is going to cause enough <laughs> irritation that you know you have an inflammatory yeah. response and um you know so uh, yeah okay yeah so um and uh you know bd guys he's he's grant scott in the comments if you guys aren't, aren't aware and so i would be remiss if i didn't mention so we have a a podcast it's all things male pod um i don't know bd if in the comments if you can write like the actual official name and uh we really need to pick that back up because i would love to discuss some of these things and i feel like it'd be you and bd teaming up against me and a lot of these points but it's all right i'm here for it so you know you mentioned that you know you don't think that uh thank you bd it's, it's in the comments now guys all things male pod um and so so like I go back and forth on growth hormone and actually like one of my upcoming video topics is actually about growth hormone, specifically like the um, insulin like growth factor one or IGF one and whether or not it actually is beneficial or it's actually going to be harmful when it comes to PE because I've heard a lot of guys say that, you know, or at least I always get asked about like the role of growth hormone, which is technically a PED. And so you said kind of blanket statement, PEDs don't really do much for um, PE. Do you still feel that way about about growth hormone and IGF one? I should have I should have been a little more specific with my answer. Um, anabolic steroids do not help with PE. 
um, <clears throat> performance enhancing drugs uh, potentially, potentially do. Um, so growth hormone, um, growth hormone is one of these things that we still don't really, even in sort of the you know bodybuilding world and powerlifting world where people are willing to fuck around with anything. Powerlifters don't actually, you know, fuck around with that much. Um, you know, uh, you, you, you don't actually need large doses of anything to be as strong as humanly possible. It's when you're trying to, it's when you're trying to, uh, accomplish goals that are mutually exclusive naturally, like gaining muscle while burning fat, um, that you need a shit ton of different, co you know, compounds that are sort of working right. to get you at a super physiological level of muscularity and leanness simultaneously. But all that to say, um, I've never done growth hormone. I don't intend to do growth hormone okay. because sure. I, I do not think that growth hormone actually helps or has a place. Um, one of my, one of my uh, mentors in powerlifting uh, is um, the great Stan Efferding, um, who's the world's strongest bodybuilder, um, inventor of the uh, vertical diet. Um, and uh, he's been a pro strongman, pro bodybuilder, pro powerlifter. Um, so, I mean, the guy's got the chops to say a lot of things very authoritatively. And He's also, you know, a multimillionaire. So if anybody can afford good, good gear, it's him. He actually owned, he actually owned a pharmaceutical company that he ran out of Puerto Rico. It used to be called Wellness Fitness Nutrition, um, but it was actually a like an off-label like TRT uh, clinic kind of thing. Um, so all that to be all that said, Stan Efferding has actually said that you know, he, he doesn't think that growth hormone is worth it. He doesn't think that growth hormone actually helps. So my take on it is this, and this is going to be a really simple take because I'm just not that educated on it. Um, you know how everybody takes B12, like everybody takes vitamin B12 for like fat loss and stuff. There's, there's not a study that exists that shows that vitamin B12 helps with fat loss unless you are deficient. So, right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Similarly, yeah. similarly, I think that unless you are, there is one exception to the whole growth hormone thing. And that is that um, we have a finite amount of androgen receptors in our body. And so growth hormone can kind of overcome that yes. saturation issue um but again that's that's really a that's a that's a bodybuilder issue it's not something that you know powerlifters have to worry about because powerlifters just don't typically run shit tons of gear uh, yeah it does not it just does not take that much to be absolutely as strong as possible um yeah. so a final statement i i believe that Growth hormone may be beneficial if you are deficient. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So it's, uh, you know, I was planning on this just being an hour and we're already at like an hour and almost 15 minutes. So <laughs> let's try to knock out these like last couple okay. of questions that I have right. uh, pretty, Rapid pretty fire. quickly. So as BD has liked to call me out in the comments. So I don't, I don't know if you knew this, but I am like, I am not very pro rest days. And so um, okay. you know, with, with a specific caveat, like my entire routine sometimes takes as little as 30 minutes and it's like 10 or 15 minutes of stretching and then like 10 or 15 minutes of pumping and then that's it. And so, yeah. um, you know, it's, I don't feel like I need to take more than 23 and a half hours off to recover. And when I interviewed Dr. Brandeis, you know, he kind of gave a, an unfulfilling answer. Cause I was like, what do you think about rest days? And he was like, mother nature doesn't take, take rest days. So I recommend my protocol seven days a week. That was also with, I know, I know it's crazy, but that was also with his PRP, which could in theory help speed recovery. And so short answer, how important are rest days go? <sighs> You're going to make a <laughs> short, short answer. All right. I, I could see the wheels turning. I will answer this as I would be as succinct as possible. Um, 
rest days in training, powerlifting, are mm-hmm. determined by your level of conditioning and your total volume. Okay. Okay. So one of the ways that I train is I will do my heavy movement. I'll work up to a max effort squat, a bench, or deadlift in an evening. And then the next morning, I will go back to the gym and I will do accessory work to build the squat, the bench, or the deadlift. Okay. So I actually train. Um, it, it, my normal schedule actually has nine training uh, sessions in a week. Um, wait, hold on for yeah, so nine nine training sessions in a week. Um, some people would say that that's a lot. The fact is that I have the conditioning to actually do that. Okay. Now, the distinction needs to be made that what we are talking about in training in the gym is we are building tissues to be stronger and more resilient, which is not what we're trying to do with penis enlargement, right? We want to make our penis longer, not stronger. Okay. Right. So I think that in your case, if you're doing 30 minutes or, you know, 15 minutes or something like that, I just don't think that you are at what in training, what we would call your maximum recoverable volume. So if you're not hitting your maximum recoverable volume, then I think you're fine to train every day. Um, So people have to realize that uh, work and recovery have to exist at an equal rate in order for progress to continue. And that's right. true in training in the gym. Um, you know, you have to recover as hard as you train. And I, I honestly think that that's one of the reasons that I'm on the all time top 100 list is because I, you know, was a soft tissue specialist. And I, I you know, I was like, I'm not going to end up with the same issues that I treat my clients with. Like, I know better. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if you're extending, you know, for an hour with an apex, um, you know, and you're doing that, uh, five days a week. Yeah. I mean, probably you, yeah. you might want to take two days off, dude. Yeah. Cause that's a lot. That's a lot of fatigue and fatigue accumulates, you know? Um, so basically what, what, what I'm saying in your case is like, you're doing enough work that your body can actually recover in 23 hours. If you're using a mail hanger and you're using like progressive overload or something like that, or you're using, you know, the apex and you're doing heavy work. Yeah. I think that you need to understand fatigue management. Right. Fatigue does and fatigue does stack and, and, and I can prove that. And that's actually part of my auto regulation program is I measure my bone press uh, stretch flaccid length every day. And if I take two rest days off, um, as of right now, my, my resting measurements after two or three days off will be 230 millimeters. Okay. Um, the very next day, uh, I might be 232 millimeters. The yeah. day after the day after that, I might be 235 millimeters. That to yeah. me is indicative that those tissues are still fatigued. Yeah. And that fatigue does in fact accumulate. Yeah. That's so, it. I mean, <laughs> I'm just kind of blown away. Like, so guys, 232 millimeters is 23 centimeters, guys. <laughs> that, that is freaking insane. Uh, good for you, man. So, the last, the like, the last question for this, and then we'll save the rest for the all things male pod. Is um, okay. So uh, we we've kind of talked about it, but micro tears. So do you believe like that part of this actual process involves invoking actual micro tears in the tunica? Because once again, he's not the authority, but Brandeis said that. I was like, explain to me the physiology, and he was like, well, micro tears, and I was just like, Meh. so you know, what are your thoughts? No, I disagree. Okay. Um, I disagree just because um, in every other part of the body, we've proven that uh, edema, mechanical tension, your, your, your cells sensing mechanical tension, 
and spending mm -hmm. time under tension are actually more important factors uh, more important factors uh, that cause cellular proliferation than micro tears. I think that I think that you know saying all PE or all muscle building or all tissue accumulation is based on the amount of micro tears that you uh, accumulate is narrow minded and and just sort of oblivious of the data that we have out there because i mean to be quite yeah. honest you know so we don't have studies on penile tissue but we have studies on the constituent tissues that the penis is made of right so like we know what how collagen responds we know how a collagen elastin you know mixture responds we know how fascia responds we know how smooth muscle responds so we can extrapolate from those studies and we can safely say that like unless some magic penis fairy exists that just cuts our <laughs> dick off from reacting in a like manner do you do you understand what i'm saying like yeah, unless no, I got you. unless the laws of physics literally stop at the base of your penis right right then right. then then claiming micro tears as the primary factor is just uh, ignoring the data um, that exists okay. on the rest of the body because the, the three most important factors that cause cellular proliferation are the body uh, sensing uh, tension, which is what we call mechanical tension. So the body senses tension, uh, and then edema, and then time mm -hmm. under tension, which time under tension uh, is uh, equivalent to fatigue. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I, just, I, just, like, wait. I just disagree. I just disagree. That's just a fat no for me. <laughs> well, it was like, I, I, you know, I, I hope I controlled my face, but it was one of those things where like he said micro tears and I was just like, like, wait, what? Like what? <laughs> um, but uh, no, but and because, you know, and, and I'll expound on this a little bit more because, okay, if the primary mechanism of penis enlargement was micro tears, we would see the absolute necessity for progressive overload you would always have to do that because the body's response to micro tears in connective tissues like fascia um collagenous tissues and ligamentous tissues is to cause fibrotic densification right you know it, it just lays down scar tissue Right. And scar tissue grows in a three-dimensional cross fiber matrix. It, it's not organized in any one direction. And so it yeah. just it just restricts everything. So yeah. to state that the primary mechanism is microtrauma is just sort of to me belies a narrow understanding of basic physiology. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not gonna he he was kind enough to come on my, you know, whatever this is and uh and it was like very somebody's, courteous very educational so somebody's yeah. liking the shit out of what i just said so i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but i mean I, I i certainly agree with you as well so um man it is like 23 minutes past my bedtime right now um guys if you haven't hit that like button already i really would appreciate it i've never had such a high like to number of people in the chat before like we almost have more likes than people in here so um Damn, i attribute that all it. to to Perv McSwerve being our, our guest today. And so <laughs> we will have to get our All Things Mail podcast back where we can have BD yeah. chiming in in person and not just in the comments. And so we will get that to you guys um, soon. Watch our um, likes go down when he comes on. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because um, people, it, he really does have like a hit squad. I mean, people really do love to hate on us. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, you know, sometimes, and I, you know, BD, I don't know if you're still on here, but sometimes, like, like I said, BD is kind of hard headed in his, in his ways, and instead of like, okay, constructive criticism, he's just like, no, fuck that. <laughs> but it's all good. The, the the thing that I'll say, and I'll say this publicly, is that um, I have never challenged BD and him not eventually come around to at least somewhat agreeing with me <laughs> and i no i mean i really do i really you know one of the reasons that you know my my, my business partner curve um one of the reasons that i admire him and, and and i hold him you know so near and dear to my heart is because 
he is a person who has always been able to change my mind and he has always yeah. been a person that's apt to changing his mind and i think that changing your mind is a real sign of intelligence i think it's a real you know yeah. um it's it, it just shows that you're learning and you're and you're taking in new information and you're doing yeah. you know what you can to better yourself so yeah and you know and i i do have to give a big shout out to bd because you know, there's a, a lot of reasons we spoke kind of offline, but I was, you know, harboring some kind of like weird, misplaced, uh, kind of honestly animosity towards you. And it was completely inappropriate. And BD was like, dude, Hink, STFU, like you're being stupid right now. Like you really need to like, just, just talk to this guy. He's like, you guys are so smart and you guys like share similar things. You need to just talk. And of course, because um, I was actually, you know, I was just full on, like, just prick for, for no reason. Well, I won't say for no <laughs> reason. Probably insecurities. Probably just like, you know, here's a guy on here that is like, well, shit, this guy's smarter than I am. And, you know, you know, I'm supposed to be the guy on getting bigger talking about scientific things. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it was multifactorial. But he was dead on, man. And he was like, I called you. And instantly it was like, man, like, why have we not been talking longer so guys bd is the one who really put this whole thing together for for anybody that's that's watching right now but i will also say i was like bd what if we just bought a shit ton of vigor and sent it to amazon just so we would have stock now you know we didn't really have the funds to buy like a huge amount and he was like no 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 that's a bad idea let's not do that and then like a month later the dude was like pink what if we got a bunch of vigor and sent it to Amazon? And I was just like, dude, <laughs> like, dude I, just, yeah. I just said that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I, I know, I know. But anyways, oh, yeah, I love BD too. Um, you know, I we do. certainly have yeah. our little, our lover's quarrels. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyways, guys, um, I can't, Adam, I can't thank you enough for being on here, man. We got to do this again with BD. Um, Absolutely. You know, the, yeah. The viewers have enjoyed. I've learned a lot. And um, thank you all for joining. If you haven't already, hit that like button and um, catch you guys on the next one. i got to remember my catchphrase. There's nothing wrong with self-improvement, guys. But just remember, you are enough just as you are. Okay? Uh, catch you guys on the next one. Peace and love. All right. Now let's see if I can figure out how to end this live. All right, guys. <laughs> Later, guys. <laughs>